Hello, my name is Mark Schnesk. I'm Senior Application Engineer with Silent Design Solutions. And this video is a replay of a recorded video session for the Wisconsin ACEC 2021 Civil 3D workshop uh, that was held in September of this year. Uh, in this session, we are discussing utilizing Civil 3D and in particular aerial LIDAR from SUAS data in a preliminary design workflow. Uh, we'll do some feature data extraction from LIDAR using Autodesk InfoWorks, uh, and then Recap Civil 3D, of course, are also going to be involved. We're then going to use some of the uh, opening uh, of the grading optimization tool as well. So I hope you enjoy. Uh, if you have any questions, my contact information uh, will be in the comments as well as at the end of the video. Thank you very much and enjoy. And in this session... We'll be utilizing Civil 3D in preliminary design using a small unmanned aerial system data. Now, the purpose of this session is to differentiate between the different types of small unmanned aerial systems and the sensors available for them. These include rotary versus fixed wing, the photogrammetry sensor, or a LiDAR sensor. When to choose the appropriate type of sensor and model, the benefits of each, vegetation considerations, accuracy versus speed. And we'll demonstrate using some collected data, LiDAR data in particular, in a preliminary site design in Civil 3D. Now, what is an SUAS, a small unmanned aerial systems? What we commonly refer to in here is drones. So drones are small, either quad or fixed wing aircraft used to carry a payload in the air for a variety of purposes. They're safe, accurate, and affordable. Most importantly, data collected from small unmanned aerial systems are much more affordable than traditional photogrammetry methods. They're typically used in survey construction, agriculture, conservation, mining, inspection, search and rescue, and more. I have many personal drones. I, have, I think they're fun. I like to fly them just for a hobby or for aerial photography. Most systems are automated and easy to operate, though you can manually fly them around and collect data uh, as you need to. So most of the data is are on a quadcopter or on a gimbal that can be rotated, they're stabilized, and you can fly in and, uh, and get data in a variety of methods. Use it as an additional tool in conjunction with traditional survey collection systems. Like anything else, it's another tool in the box. It's not meant to replace surveyors or traditional survey equipment, but to augment it. There are a variety of types of small unmanned aerial systems to suit your needs. There are multi-rotor and fixed wing are the two common types. Multi-rotor, also known as quadcopters, or there are other multi-rotor copters with more than four rotors. They're small and maneuverable. They're versatile. They're easy to get up in the air very quickly. They have multiple payloads available. Some drones only have a single payload. Some have multiple ones you could put on, including a LiDAR photogrammetry module or an even inspection camera. They can be used for visual inspections or search and rescue with thermal cameras. Unfortunately, they have a shorter battery life than fixed wing. It takes a lot of energy to keep that weight in the air. Uh, most systems are going to be able to fly around 35 to 40 minutes uh, on modern systems. Fixed wing aircraft on the other half uh, are used for high speed large sites and they're very efficient. Once they take off, they use the forward speed of the drone to use lift off the wings to keep it aloft. The payload sensors are typically in a nadir straight down only so there's not a gimbal. They can require a larger open takeoff and landing area. So there's some that require a catapult launch. There's some that take off your traditional method. And there's some that are vertical takeoff with a tilt rotor or tilt wing system uh, to transition from that vertical to horizontal flight. But they still require a lot of open space to land. 
Both systems can carry either photogrammetry or LiDAR payload systems. Now, what is photogrammetry? So we're going to talk about the two most common types of sensors carried. Photogrammetry or camera systems, these are used for high density models. Um, they're used uh, based on uh, uh, their way of measuring distances using photographs. You can create ortho mosaic maps. So if you need a overall geo reference orthometric photo of your site or orthographic photo of your site as a background, um, then photogrammetry is what you need. They're very, very easy to use. They have a lower cost than LiDAR. So they're usually the first solution people reach for. They're easier to control. Uh, you can control the mission speed, uh, the altitude, and the accuracy uh, are very easy to control. But the downsides are they're dependent on a good quality camera. So you can't just pick up any drone with a rolling shutter camera and expect to have spectacular results. So we're going to use something that has a fixed focused camera uh, with a very large sensor to collect a lot of light data. Uh, they're dependent on atmospheric considerations as well. Um, your, your lighting condition, your weather conditions, try to fly it in fog, you're not going to get much. So haze, smoke, and all those things can be a detriment to your final solution of your model. Um, and it takes a lot of processing power. So once you collect you know, anywhere from hundreds to maybe even thousands of photos in the mosaic pattern, uh, you can wait a very long time for the processing. So you can make many hours for your results. And uh, most importantly, no, the data is not able to penetrate vegetation. So when you're getting your final model, you're getting the top of grass, you're getting the top of a field, you're getting data at the top of a tree canopy, but you're not able to get that absolute ground data below that vegetation. Typical model collection is done very traditionally using a, a linear pattern. So you set up a mission and the drone flies itself back and forth over a site, turns around, does it again, think of mowing a lawn, okay? You're typically gonna need a high overlap, anywhere from 80% to 80%, that means each image is only capturing 20% more data than the previous photo. This includes the forward motion of the drone and the side overlap. It requires ground control points for absolute accuracy. Plus you require some checkpoints too. You're gonna to wanna to be able to check your model versus uh, uh, ground control or ground points of known elevation. And typically you have to fly a little more outside of your area of interest. This can also be a detriment if you're in next to a no-fly zone or a critical sensitive area where you're not allowed to take the aircraft. The processing takes a little bit. Photogrammetry requires processing software to create your model. Typically, we're talking about something like PIX4D or Autodesk Recap Photo plus Drone Deploy. There are many others available to you. Um, Typical file formats are going to be LAS or LAZ. These are common file formats used by point clouds uh, in, in, in any software. Plus, with photogrammetry, you can get, again, that geotiff or the metric photo. Um, LAS or LAZ files must be processed through Autodesk Recap prior to using Civil 3D or InfraWorks. LiDAR, on the other hand, is ideal for complex terrain with a high percentage of vegetation coverage. So this is going to be able to penetrate through those leaves. Think of standing underneath the tree looking up and everywhere you can see blue sky. Those are the holes that LiDAR can penetrate through to get to the ground. It's an active laser source. It stands for laser direction and ranging. Actually, laser detection and ranging. Um, so it's collected in a similar flight pattern. You can set up a flight mission where it flies back and forth to collect the data, or you can manually point the laser sensor um, at an object and collect data manually. Because everything is geo-referenced in a particular drone, everything can be tied together into a single model after, okay? You could penetrate foliage. It's independent of lighting conditions. You could, you could even fly a LiDAR system uh, mission in the dead of night. You don't need an active light source. Okay, The intensity of returns can be broken down and used for feature extraction. So because this has an active light source, 
a laser light goes out, it strikes an object of a certain material and a certain percentage of that light comes back to the sensor. Different materials give back different returns and you can very easily see those within your model to differentiate between different types of, of, of breaks between uh, edge of pavement, gravel, grass, things like that to pull out that linear data. The cons are they're a little bit of higher cost and it requires extra time to fly. You can have to fly a little bit slower than you would for photogrammetry. And it requires a, an IMU calibration. The IMU is the inertial measurement unit within the drone that keeps track of its orientation and position in the sky, uh, along with the GNS RTK solution. Most of these drones nowadays that fly LIDAR and photogrammetry have real-time kinematic uh, GNSS solution to get that one to three centimeter precisional accuracy of the, the, the position of the drone in the sky. So let's talk about accuracies. We're talking about LIDAR and photogrammetry accuracies. LIDAR, I, I label the slide LIDAR, but the same holds true with photogrammetry. Um, it depends. Um, LIDAR accuracies depend a lot on your hardware budget. Uh, we call hardware budget because as little errors propagate in the drone, they'll trickle down through your final product. So the actual position, precision of the actual LiDAR sensor itself, uh, the positional accuracy of the drone, uh, either the, the GNSS solution or the IMU solution, do they, do they jive, do they, they, they cross together? Boresight alignment, how accurately is it modeled the position of the drone versus the position of the sensor, okay? And any kind of angle encoding error that could come out. Um, do you have control on the ground? Are you tying your model into control post-processing? Uh, those could be factors in your accuracy. In practice, what we've been finding for, for modern LiDAR systems is about a three to six centimeters plus or minus in vertical error. Um, the L1 that we'll be demonstrating today, we've been seeing a, a mean RMS error of about three centimeters for for you know 67 percent of the points in, in any uh, band that we slice. So we've been getting you know about an inch inch and a half of of, of accuracy. Okay, lidar processing uh, requires proprietary software based on manufacturer. It may also include third party IMU software such as POSPAC. So. With a system like the DJI M300 um, and the L1 package, everything's tied together and a lot of that solution is done within the actual payload itself. Something like a micro drone with an Aplanix IMU, you'll have to run the IMU solution through a software like POSPAC and then tie it back into the GNSS solution. Uh, and make sure that they merge together so you'll get a corrected position based upon. So it's an extra step that has to be taken. Um, you're going to get out an LAS or LAZ file format. Um, you're not going to typically get orthophoto. As a matter of fact, some LiDAR systems don't even collect, and you, know, you can't get a color uh, point cloud out of it. Um, you'll have to use some kind of third-party uh, point cloud colorization tool using aerial photography. Um, and But other drones like or other payloads like the L1 will collect photos and colorize your LiDAR on the fly. Again, data gotten from LiDAR has to be processed through Autodesk Recap. Okay, uh, just talking about the different systems, we're going to do a little demonstration. We're going to focus on LiDAR today. Um, I've done photogrammetry sessions in the past. So this is data that's collected with the DJI Matrice M300 using an L1 LiDAR payload. Uh, there'll be multiple returns on this collected data. Oh, I didn't touch upon that. For each uh, pulse of light uh, that's sent out, you can you can you can get what's called different returns. So um, it'll set out a series of pulses, and the first object that comes back uh, in that direction, it says, "Okay, this is my first return. It may be top of leaf canopy or some other hard object." And then the next pulse that comes back could be the mid canopy and the next pulse that come back hopefully is ground not necessarily it's whatever the third object that struck and so you can use this in reconstruction and analyzing your model to see if you've actually made that penetration down to the ground i'll show you an example of that uh, we process this in dji terra uh, we did this with a 50 percent overlap so every point in our model uh, in 3d space has been hit at least three times with the lidar 
Um, and we're going to create an Autodesk InfraWorks model and a simple 3D site model from it. And we'll do a quick preliminary grading using the grading optimization tools as well. So let's go ahead and dive in. Okay, the first portion we're going to look at in our demonstration is the actual data that was collected using the DJI Matrice M300 with the Zenmuse L1 LiDAR package. Um, this is a site we flew um, for one of our demo days, and I'm just going to go through the software. So once the LiDAR comes off of the system, it gets processed and reconstructed in a proprietary software. In this case, we're looking at DJI Terra. Now, uh, with this particular package, pretty much everything is ready to go onto the box. Um, the only things I have done to this is I have applied a coordinate system. So um, I've shifted my LiDAR from typically drone data is collected in WGS84 um, with the ellipsoid height. Um, I've used the software to switch, shift my coordinate system. In this case, this was down in Carbondale, Illinois. So i am uh, shifted to a known coordinate system. Um, the uh, Illinois West State Plain, NAT83, um, and a orthometric height uh, of NAVD88 um, um, conversion. So once that's done, the software very easily uh, collects that data. So I'm just going to rotate around. This is typical for what I would think of for LiDAR data. I have a little bit of noise where traffic was. Um, you can see the color patterns, the way the drone uh, actually uh, uh, colorizes the, the point cloud is with aerial photo. So as light and clouds change, depending on the, 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 the area that I've collected, you might get some differential. We had a kind of a, a partly cloudy day, and as the shadows fell in different areas, different areas got uh, colorized differently. The more important aspect of a drone or LiDAR data, though, is its reflectivity. So I'm going to switch over to a reflectivity mode, and here you could see a more common pattern that I would see. So you can see the different color bands represent different amounts of energy returning. You can see by the, the, the side here. So pavement is going to be in that uh, it's very light absorbing. Uh, and shadows and tree are very light absorbing in trees. So they're going to come out in those bluers. Um, the reflective pavement marking is going to be very highly reflective. So you can really differentiate between... The pavement, the pavement marking, the shoulder lines, the the uh, the paint markings. Um, here's a fence line, grass. Um, here's a pavilion and different things like that. Um, the height model as well. I can get really easily see the terrain layout based upon the height model. And we discussed returns a little bit. I'm gonna switch over to the returns. So I chose three returns. The first bounce back of LiDAR was the top of canopy, and then the green represents the second return, and then the red, the third. So as I rotate my model around underneath, you can see that we've got not, a, not everywhere, depending on the density, the type of tree, but I actually have some ground data down here. Um, that's typically more than I would normally get using a traditional survey. So as I bounce around, you can see I have some points that I can use underneath the canopy uh, to get an accurate model for that area. Uh, if this was photogrammetry, I would only see the tops of trees and I'd have great big holes underneath where I couldn't uh, get that. Uh, there's another spot, very dense pine tree. Um, not so much on this one because the density, you could see missing points. I have one rare point in the middle here sometimes. Again, maybe enough to connect the dots to create a, uh, a point cloud. So this is the, the, the LiDAR is its uh, data that it's come off. It's been processed in DJI Terra, um, and by default, it automatically outputs to a, um, a, an LAS file. So I'm going to get that, and I'm going to plug that in through Autodesk Recap, uh, and then I'm just going to trim out an area. So if our hypothetical, we're going to put a little... Um, office building that comes off the road right here with a small parking lot. So let's move on to that. Okay, my next step here is to bring that LAS data. We've gone ahead, processed the data from the LiDAR sensor into its proprietary software, exported it out as an LAS file, 
And now I'm going to bring it into Autodesk Recap. So I'm going to start a brand new project here. Um, I'm going to import that point cloud. Um, I'm going to give it a, a name here. So I'll just call this LiDAR site. And then uh, I'll give it a folder where I want to put the, the, the data file. So it's going to contain that RCP, that recap point project file and a folder that's going to contain the converted LAS to RCS scan. These are the types of, 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 of files that I can bring into Civil 3D directly. In our case, we're going to bring it into Autodesk InfraWorks to process first. So I'm going to go ahead and hit proceed. I'm going to select the file to import. Um, there's my point cloud. So I'm going to choose that LAS file and open that. Um, I'm going to typically look at my advanced settings. So this first one's going to be the intensity of points. If this was photogrammetry, I wouldn't want to touch this at all because all photogrammetry is going to be 0% intensity. There's no active light source. But for LiDAR, we, you saw, as you saw, we have that variety of intensity. So I can call and trim if I'm not, if I want to get rid of dead space or maybe some lighten up my site a little bit, um, I can bring this up to say, hey, Get rid of any points that are below 10% intensity, maybe they're low accuracy as well, and clip that data and make it a little bit smaller if I wanted to. And under the advanced tab, I can, I can change my coordinate system. So recap by default always converts things into meters, but it's a direct conversion from whatever coordinate system I had here. So if I had not used Terra, to convert from WGS84 lat lawn to my state plane coordinate system, I could do that here in recap as well. But I'm going to leave it alone. I'm going to let the current and the target stay the same. This is going to stay in meters, but that's okay because recap, uh, or, or sorry, uh, InfraWorks and Civil 3D will make that conversion automatically. So you're going to come out in the US survey feed. Um, I can also do a physical decimation of the point in recap. I can say, okay, every five meters. Now, the, the point cloud you're going to get from the from the LiDAR can vary depending on speed and altitude. I've, I've flown slower speeds, like 100 feet off the ground AGL at four miles an hour and gotten 1,800 points per square meter. Um, this particular, I think, is somewhere around 400 to 800, somewhere in there, depending on the altitude. I think I flew this at 125 feet, maybe about 11 miles an hour. So we're going to say about 700 uh, points per square meter. That's still a lot of points, more than what I should have to deal with. So I could at least decimate them out and say, hey, if points are bigger than 15 millimeters apart, throw them out of there. You know, so I can and get rid of some of that extra point, make my point cloud a little bit lighter. Then I'll go ahead and say, once that's done, hit my import file button on the lower right. And it's going to convert that LAS file over to a, uh, a, a recap RCP. Okay, I skipped ahead a little bit. Now that it's, it's finished that conversion, it's opened up an Autodesk Recap Pro. So here's that same point cloud we saw in DJI Terra. It is now in Autodesk Recap Pro. Um, I can maneuver around, I can rotate, I can look at the same viewing aspects that I saw in, um, in, in Terra. Um, here I have additional tools. On the left side, I can change uh, its look here. As I showed you the different values, there's the elevation view. I can change the elevation range um, by, by settings here. Um, I can look at the intensity values. It's using a different color palette, but I can really see it here, the differentiation between the different types of materials, especially on my pavement line. This is going to come in handy in, in, in uh, Civil 3D and, and, and uh, uh, InfraWorks when I come to extract some linear feature lines. Um, I could change the lighting to see where the shadows are. You can see the swale there. You can see, oh, there's a, there's looks like there's a culvert opening here that crosses the road with a manhole and, and additional information. Okay, so once I get this here in a recap, most of the times I'm not going to do much in here. Uh, what I will do, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in this area. This is where I want to put a little uh, uh, a park office with a little drive entrance here in a small four or five lot parking area. Um, so I'm going to limit my model here for the, the ease of use. 
So a lot of times I'm model even to cut out things that I don't want. Um, I'll just do something simple as making a window view in recap and then clipping that data outside. So this is the kind of data that I'm going to look at. I'm probably going to have a little bit more, so I'm going to unclip. Um, and I'll include some of the trees and some of the topo so we can give a frame of reference. Clip that data outside. And then once I get the area that I want, this is what I'm interested in. What I'll typically do is go ahead and export this. So I'll hover over the Home tab and Recap, come down here and move to the Export tool. And I'll export this out. Typically, I call it, uh, uh, add the word clip to it. So I maintain the original. Uh, the nice thing about Recap when you're exporting or, uh, or uh, what they call consolidating is a single scan. So if you have multiple LAS files in here, uh, you, can tr you can combine them into a single. Is a, it's what you see is what you get. So I don't have to worry about deleting points. Um, I could just use this quick clip box to limit what I see, and that's what I get when I export out. So I'll go ahead and make a new file of this using that export tool. It's as simple as choosing this tool, giving it a name, pressing the start, and letting it go. Okay, we've gone ahead and processed our data in DJI Terra. Run it through Autodesk Recap, and now we've brought in our LiDAR point cloud into Autodesk InfraWorks. I've created a new project. I've set the project coordinate system to match the project coordinate of my site, and I've brought in my clipped Recap point cloud. So the first thing I'm going to do is I've made a, uh, a couple of new proposals. Um, typically, I would, I would have a master proposal for my point cloud. And now I'm going to run through the point cloud processing to start creating my existing ground terrain and uh, extract linear features. So under point cloud here, I'm going to hit the point cloud terrain button. And then for this, this purpose, I'm just going to leave the defaults here. Um, I've gone over this before in previous classes. Uh, uh, we're, we're going to set the optimum ground output that'll be a one meter by one meter normalized point cloud will densify point clouds where it detects linear features automatically so it'll throw more points back in in those areas i'm also going to extract some vertical features and convert those to uh, infraworks 3d objects that will export out as kogel points into civil 3d and then i'm just going to go ahead and hit start processing and it's going to start creating the point cloud terrain at this time. Okay, my terrain surface is now complete. It just took a few minutes. You can see I have some overlays uh, and the terrain in my Model Explorer. Um, I can show you the terrain looks like. I'll go to the Model Explorer and turn off the point clouds so you can actually see the surface. Okay, And it's made a nice little overlay based upon the point cloud data. So now I'm going to use the point cloud data in conjunction with the terrain to extract linear features. I'm going to go ahead and extract the pavement and shoulder lines and uh, pull out some objects here. Maybe I did additional break lines where I think I need them for the ditch lines and stuff. So I can bring this into Civil 3D and make a nice Civil 3D surface out of that. So to do that, uh, we're going to go ahead and set a point cloud theme. Now, to help me along with extraction of point cloud objects, I would typically go ahead and set a point cloud theme for showing intensity. Uh, now I've made this up. I'll show you how I made this really quick. I've, I've added a new point cloud theme using the green plus. Um, I'll change the type to intensity. Um, by default, the intensity is a black and white. I usually set this to red to blue and change the palette type to HSV counterclockwise. That'll give me a nice rainbow color, similar to what I saw in Recap. I'll also increase the number of rules to lay 25 to give me some more values, and that will give me a nice point cloud uh, intensity-themed visualization that I can use when I'm extracting the linear features. Okay, I'll then make a view style called extracted view and what this view style does in infoworks is i turn the terrain opacity way down i also get rid of the sky and brightness and then basically any of the rendered items 
So all I'm dealing with basically are the point cloud and the terrain. You can barely see it. If I turn it up, you'll see it below there. I'll turn that down because the linear feature extraction requires both points and the terrain. This gives me the best of both worlds. I'll leave the contours turned on as a frame of reference, especially when it comes time to extract things like ditch lines or something like that if I feel I need to extract that additional information. All right, to start my linear feature extraction, I'm going to choose the linear feature extraction tool up here. I'm going to turn off my view settings so you can see better um, under the manage tab. So once I start this, you'll see I have my dialog box right here. I can move it around the window. First thing I'm going to do is choose a style. So like the first thing I'm going to extract maybe will be these pavement striping. So um, I'm going to choose a manual style. So when I export this out in the civil 3D, it's going to come out as shapefile data into 3D polylines. And if I bring in the object data, the object data will be have the attributes of whatever type this is. So if I get lost, I can select the object, look at the object data and say, oh, this is a paint stripe or oh, this is a brake line. Uh, so I could choose a, a variety of different pre-made styles in InfraWorks. If I click on the box and choose more styles, you can see the default styles that are in there, bottom of curve, top of curve, paint stripe, passing lane, etc. So I'll choose paint stripe and choose OK. Now I have an automatic or a manual mode. In manual mode, I just pick points in random and, and it will just like drawing a polyline in Civil 3D, it will create a linear feature by points uh, in InfoWorks. But there is the automatic mode. And for LiDAR, I don't have to choose UAV compatible. Um, I'm going to go ahead and click on this button and then here it says pick the first point so I'm going to choose a point here on my stripe and I'm going to move ahead a little bit and I'm going to double click further up the road here maybe a little less maybe about 20 feet up 25 feet up double click and it's going to find that pattern and follow it all the way down now it may get lost you know once it gets up there once I hit escape on the button you can see the vertices in there I may have to slide them and adjust those. Um, if it was a curb feature or something like that, um, I can right click on this line and say show cross section view and you would see where that point lies in my cross section. So I could use the vertical tools here to shift it around as I need to. Um, and it creates a new vertex. So if I moved it up here, uh, you would see the vertex it creates. So I'm gonna move that back to where it should be. All right about there. And then I can use my tools here to move up and down station to make that correction as need be. Specifically valuable for curb lines and things like that. Um, I'll go ahead and do another one. Let's go ahead and do the center line of the road. So vertical feature extraction. I'm going to change my type to center line. Now for pavement striping like this where it's broken, you start at the beginning of your pattern go entirely through that first skip and beyond the second point pattern. So it'll detect this, this skipped line here, this dashed line. Oh, let's try that again. Sometimes I amaze myself. Let's try it again. Click, click. There it is. Now I got it. So now it, it figured it out and followed that down. And again, I may have to come through either by grabbing vertices or the, the legs and, and manually, you know, bring those back and then we'll adjust the elevations that needs to for those objects and I'll follow that down now I got to pull it back here a little bit so I'm just going to grab it and bring it back I'm going to leave that in the video because every once in a while you're going to get those kind of errors so it's always good to see how you can correct that and I'll continue on for edge of pavement and you know fence line if I wanted to if I wanted to so I could see there's a break line here um, I may choose linear feature extraction, go to manual, choose to a break line style, and just manually, like I said earlier, just pick some points along that break line, and that will help me to find that break line back in Civil 3D if, if I really need it. Skipping here uh, a little bit, I've gone ahead and extracted the remainder of my lines that I am, I am interested in. Uh, I'm not going to touch this side as much more in 
tuned to details on the right side here. Um, I've also gone ahead and done a vertical feature extraction. So um, under here, under the point cloud uh, tools is vertical feature extraction, and it will run through and identify features that it thinks are vertical features that I can add to my model. Uh, by default, it's going to be one of the four types here, tree or uh, sign or unknown. But once you place the object, you can go ahead and um, you know, if I said, hey, this is supposed to be a pine tree here, um, I can double click on that and change the, the, the manual or the rule style for it and say, oh, no, this is supposed to be a, a pine tree or something like that and, and make that update. So that'll go ahead and change those objects if I need to after the fact. But they'll come out of InfoWorks as Kogo points when I do my extraction. Okay. So the next thing we're going to do is extract all this data out. So once you've gotten your data together, um, under your point cloud tools, under the manage tab, you're going to come down here to export point cloud. So in the export point cloud, it's going to export out a brand new RCS file, or a recap scan file. And instead of being these thousands and thousands of points, sometimes millions of points, it's going to be whatever the, 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 the vertical terrain, uh, when I created that terrain, that, that density I set. So for optimal, it'll be a one meter by one meter grid. Kind of if you went out in the field with a, with a uh, rover and, uh, and shot, you know, just a grid point of topo out there. We're also going to extract uh, out our linear features as an Esri shape file. These will come in a simple 3D as a 3D polyline. So once I get my, my base surface made with the point cloud, I'll add these lines back in to bring in that extra detail back to my model. Um, under the transverse vertices, uh, if, if for each of these, I could have cut cross sections in the tool called transverse vertices. So if to, to identify that, you could pick one of these, uh, these lines and say generate transverse lines. It'll go ahead and create cross sections. These come in as a cross section Kogel point. And I haven't really found, to be honest with you, a, a, a tool where I would need this, maybe if I was doing a river section for RFA or something like that. Um, but, but those will come in uh, that way. And then uh, my vertical features, I chose to bring those in as a CSV. Very important, if you, if you left your, your original coordinate system in WGS84 lat lawn, it's very important that you change your targets to whatever projection you're going to need in Civil 3D because if I'm using, dealing with U.S. foot, WGS 84 is in meters, and it's going to bring in all the elevations for these, these linear features you know, in meters, and it's going to really mess up your point cloud if you don't do that. So make sure your target coordinate system matches exactly what you want. And then just go ahead and start export. So we'll do that, and then we'll jump over to Civil 3D and create our existing surface. Now we've moved over to Civil 3D 2022. I've gone ahead and exported all my items from Autodesk InfoWorks, my linear features, my vertical features. I'm now ready to make my surface, my existing ground surface here in Civil 3D. Uh, so to do that, uh, the first thing I'm gonna do is import my point clouds. So um, I've already gone ahead and set up a project coordinate system in here for the uh, uh, Illinois State Plains West, since I'm down in Carbondale. Um, I'm gonna say insert, and I'm gonna go to my attach point cloud. So now I'm going to come to this export. Now, by default, it's looking for point cloud project RCP because InfoWorks exports as an RCS file. I'll change my file as a type to RCS. There's my exported point cloud. I'm going to go ahead and open that and just drop it into place. So there's my one meter by one meter gridded point cloud. From there, just as I would with a normal point cloud in Civil 3D, I will select it. And in my ribbon, I'll choose the create surface from point cloud. Now, this shouldn't take any time. I'll, I'll give it a name. I'll call it L1 site underscore EG. And I'll change the style to contours one and five background. I'll say next, I'm going to do the entire point cloud. There's only 7,600 points in this. It will go very quickly. And then because this is extracted already as ground, I don't have to worry about filtering. 
you choose no filter here to make sure you get the entire one. Then go ahead and create surface. As always, it's creating with this routine, it'll create the surface from that extracted point cloud in the background. It really just takes a couple seconds and there's my surface. So you can see there, it's the location where the culvert was. Here's my land area. This is uh, uh, where that pavilion was in the tree area. So now I'm gonna go ahead and add my linear features. So to do that, I'm gonna use the map import tool. And then once I start that, I gotta make sure I choose the files of type Esri shapefile. So here are all my linear features that I extracted out of Autodesk Infoworks in that folder that I placed them in. I'm gonna select that and click OK. And in the dialog box here, I'm also gonna choose the Add Data button and then choose Create Object Data. This will add that, remember that style like paint stripe or brake line, it's gonna add that indicator as object data to these polylines. And then uh, I always choose import polylines as closed polylines, even though I don't have any, it's just a habit to make sure I don't get any solid shapes. And when I click OK, there's the linear features I extracted. So if I select on uh, this line, I can look at my object data and look, it's a linear paint stripe. And this is a center line, and this is a edge of pavement and so on. So I can use this to go ahead and um, change layers and things like that of these lines. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. We'll, we'll, we'll come back in a different model here very quickly. Okay, uh, I've gone ahead and uh, cleaned up my drawing a little bit, uh, brought those uh, cocoa points in, the trees that I extracted, as well as changed the layers of all, all my different line types. Uh, I've now gone ahead and created a, an existing site plan too. So this could be a proposed site plan. It's just going to be a, a consist of a building with some sidewalk, a parking area, and an entrance off of the road. So, and I've also delineated an area of uh, my grading limits. So very quickly to show you how quickly we go from LiDAR data to creating an existing surface model to creating an AutoCAD background drawing adding some 2D geometry. By the way, uh, all this geometry is at zero elevation. So this is just 2D quick sketches. Now we're gonna go ahead and switch uh, tack here. We're gonna go to the new um, Autodesk uh, uh, grading, well, where it is it, I'm gonna analyze, the grading optimization tool. And uh, when using this, you're, you're gonna need a series of lines and closed polylines to define your geometry. So I'm gonna go ahead and choose my grading objects. And this opens up a tool palette that shows the different types of, of, of grading objects that I can apply to my drawing. Um, this has been covered in other, under uh, uh, other videos. Autodesk has put out a complete series. John Sayer does a wonderful job at, at, at going through the preliminary. There's a little three-step, three or four-step video. But just to, to cover what's going on here, I could take these 2D objects and create a preliminary grading plan based upon my LiDAR. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and set a grading limit and I'm gonna choose that outer polyline and I'm gonna say this is gonna be max slope 33, min slope 2%. I'll call this a grading limit, okay? Um, you could choose depth of material, whether or not I wanna make this a break line. This is gonna be a grading limit and I can change the color, okay? So I'm also gonna set this as a building pad. So I'm gonna choose building pad here. And I'm gonna set this with a constant elevation of 440. That's about two feet or so above my center line of road for drainage purposes, okay? Um, I'm gonna make this area here a sidewalk. So I'm gonna come down here to the sidewalk aspect of it. And I wanna set this max slope at 2%. Okay, so ADA requirements, this is gonna be a 2% slope at max. I'm also gonna change the inclination to 90 degrees. Now this inclination says it's gonna slope to the north here. Um, that's where my triangles are gonna fall and it's using the AutoCAD angle. So zero is to the right, 90 is to the north. Okay, I could set my depth of material 0.5 or 0.33 uh, for grading calculation purposes. Um, this is gonna be my parking area. So I'm gonna set that as parking lot, okay? 
And, or actually, I'm going to set this as an accessible path. So that will make sure this limits. So I'm going to have well, at least one handicap spot in there. Um, that means uh, max slope 2%. It's going to treat that. And again, I'm also going to make this an aligned surface. That means it's going to align itself with this sidewalk and follow that same pattern. Okay. So no place in here should be more than 2%. Uh, finally, this area is going to be parking lot. It will treat that as a parking lot area and grade it appropriately. And then I'm just going to make this last one here a grading zone. Okay, so this is going to grade down. Now, because this touches my grading limit line, this line here is going to lie on the existing pavement and it's going to match in. Um, I also have a line that I had in here if I select it in there. And I'm going to set that as an aligned edge. That means the triangles are going to line themselves up along this edge here really nice when I run the grading optimization tool. So once I set all my attributes, and you can go to the help file and find what all the different attributes, uh, uh, grading op optimization tool attributes are available. So once that's done, I'm going to start the grading optimization tool. Now, keep in mind, this tool is part only available in Civil 3D 2022 at this time and is only part of the AEC collection. So if you do not have the AEC collection, you will not have this tool available to you. So once I bring it to the optimization tool, here are all my boundary areas. You see there's my sidewalk. I can modify them in here instead of having to go back to the drawing uh, if need be. So I can run different optional tools in here. I can set my settings here. Um, these are some global variables, number of iterations I want to run. I Maybe I'll jump that back to like 50,000, keep that a little bit small. It's the number of trial and errors it does. Here I can set some preferences, the mesh quality. The higher the mesh quality, the sharper the edges are going to be. I like to keep it on medium. It's going to automatically refine, remove existing ground points if I need to when I bring my surface in, um, and I can customize some additional uh, options. Once I do that, I'm going to start the optimize tool and you can see it's starting to grade my site based upon the rules I tell it. The grade, the grading limit will be on the outside. It knows what this pad is. It knows I want to grade the sidewalk out plus every other limit will get applied to that. So as I'm running this tool, I can look at my convergence. I'm looking for this solution to come down towards the closer it gets towards the bottom to zero the better my solution is. I'm looking pretty good here. You can see my cut and fill variables. I can make some changes here, how much weight to put towards cut and fill, how smooth I want my terrain. I could just look at this convergent plot uh, to see how well that's coming out. Once I get a solution that looks pretty good, I go ahead and I can stop this grading and I can send the optimized result back to Civil 3D. I can also bring these items in as feature lines, uh, points, and surface data, give it a new name, call this uh, 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 parking preliminary or whatever I want to. And uh, oops, let's change that to lowercase a and give it a style. We'll give it a style of one to five design. So it's reading these styles from my simple drawing and say finish. And then there's my surface back in simple 3D. Um, then I would typically take, once it's in Civil 3D, it gets treated like any other surface, and, and I can go ahead and add like a boundary to it uh, of this uh, grading limit line, and then cut that off. So there's my surface, I can look at it, and uh, let's take a look what it looks like in back in InfraWorks. Okay, finally I've, I've taken my Civil 3D model, saved it brought it back to Infork. So I exported those areas out that I used to create my preliminary grading, the parking area, the sidewalk, the building, and my grading limits as coverage areas. I exported them out of shape files, brought them in as coverage areas back to uh, InfraWorks, applied some materials. I've added some flourishes like a person, some light posts, a vehicle, the pavement striping I, I manually exported out and brought in. So you can see how quickly this was all done not much longer than the length of this video to process from LIDAR to a preliminary design model that I could take in front of a customer and say, this is our design intent. So total time really spent on this model is about three hours. That's including the six minutes it took me to fly the site with this LIDAR data and maybe the 12 minutes it took to convert that to a LAS. 
This is the power and benefit of using aerial LIDAR for preliminary grading. It is very, very uh, um, easy and quick to use. Well, I thank you for your time. I hope this has given you some ideas of things you can do with aerial LIDAR um, from uh, small unmanned aerial systems. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact us at cadtechnical at silerinst.com. You can also contact me direct at mshinesk at siler-ds.com, as well as Andrew Robb at arob at silerinst.com.